All right. Welcome to everybody. My name is Christine Housel, and I am a staff member of GlobeEthics.net based here in Geneva, working on donor relations and strategic partnerships. And that encompasses all of us who are here today. We are so delighted to welcome you to our third live chat on thematic track three of our conference, Strengthening Ethics in Higher Education Post COVID-19, Building New Bridges Together. So our track today is focused on sustainability and quality. Online education for a sustainable future, quality and ethical standards in higher education. We remind you to put yourselves on mute because there are lots of us here together. You are free to use the, the tokens um, to give a thumbs up or to applaud as a way of interacting with the speakers. Um, this time we will not do hands up to speak, but you are really encouraged to put your comments and questions along the way in the chat box. And we will pick these up and, and in conversation in today's session. And also these will all be noted for future conversations and future work together. We also, re we also would like to um, inform you that today's session will be recorded and will be available for you to watch and for others to watch into the future. So today we are so honored and pleased to have some wonderful speakers with us. I'm going to introduce them all right now, and then just when it's time, um, swiftly bring them in. So we have with us today, uh, Professor Jesse Mugambi, who is Professor of Philosophy and Religious Studies at the University of Nairobi. We have uh, Ms. Jenny Jessica R. Pietro, who is the Assistant Director of the Church at the Development and Research Department of the Protestant Church of Maluku, Indonesia. We have Professor Hani Yusuf Hassan, who is the former Vice President of the University of Sadat City and Manager of University Measurement and Assessment Center in Egypt. And we hope to have Professor Benoit Giradin. He's having a little trouble connecting. So we're all still working with these online tools. Um, he's excited to come in and, and bring us um, uh, from his wisdom uh, as former ambassador, as author. Um, so let's, let's get started with our first panelist. Um, we warmly welcome to the floor, Professor Jesse Mugambi. Can you unmute yourself, Professor? You are still muted. Can our team help Jesse unmute? Put it on. There we go. Okay, there I have to start again. So if you don't mind, um, when I hint it, you, you can then screen, but not yet. I want to begin by saying that I'm very happy to participate in this experiment, which I hope from now on will not be an experiment, but will become normative as a way of doing things. And this is because of COVID-19. We have had pandemics before, but uh, if we had them in Africa, the world did not know about them. But because of the availability of the internet, uh, it, it is, this is the first time that we have a pandemic covering the whole world and every world, the whole world knowing about it. So if nothing else positive has happened because of COVID-19, 
we have learned uh, that uh, we are one people, one community, and the world is not uh, five continents. It's actually one world on one planet. So um, now we can have uh, the, the screens. Uh, my contribution was to be on um, higher education, ethics in, in higher education. And um, yes, here, here it is. I also have mine on, um, on uh, um, my, my, my tablet here. And these are seven slides uh, or thereabouts uh, uh, summarizing the content of what I would like to share with you. Um, the globe is, uh, is it a reality or is it an illusion? Uh, in one sense, it is a reality because we are here uh, on the internet, online, uh, sharing uh, our views uh, across the entire globe. So there's, there's one sense in which it is a reality. But it is in another sense, it is an illusion because uh, hopefully we, one, one of these days we are all going to meet, but there's the possibility that some of us will never meet again except on the screen. So there's a sense in which it is a, it's an illusion uh, that we are actually together when we're imagining we are together. And this paradox uh, is one that we have to live with, not to complain about it, but to appreciate it. The impact of this online conference depends on our readiness to learn from one another. The labels we use betray our attitudes towards each other. And these labels are very often unconscious, whether ideological or religious or commercial. And we put labels on each other uh, without knowing that sometimes we may be offending. And this perhaps explains uh, the crisis we are in now in North America and increasingly in Europe. And hopefully it will not, that, um, that scourge will not come to Africa because if people are going to be exploited and oppressed racially, and if Africa were to react, this will be a second round after colonial rule and it will not be funny. So we are learning to work together as, a, as, a, as, a, as, as people of the, whole, of the whole world. And it is COVID-19 that has made us realize this. Third number two, how we view each other globally. Africa is labeled by others, but Africa does not label others. This, in my view, is ethical inconsistency. I would want to suggest, and Global Ethics can actually push this forward, that from now onwards, the date of today, we should use the, lab the label tropical Africa, because Africa is the only continent where the equator passes through the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. No other continent is so central to the world. It's also the only continent where the prime meridian, meridian zero, that passes through Greenwich, passes through Africa. It's a sense, therefore, in which Africa is actually the center continent on this planet. But it is now treated as if there are two Africas, one which is called Sub-Sahara, and Sahara is in the continent of Africa, and uh, supra-Sahara, as if Africa is defined by a desert. It's an insult, and those who have used that label do not realize how insulting it is. Why would anyone want to define the people by an area in it, which happens to be a desert? I wish we were defined by the equatorial forest, which is the, the largest in, in the world, which passes where I live. But why would you want to define people by a desert? So from now on, if we use the, uh, the, the, the meridians, the meridian, the prime meridian, and we use the tropics, then nobody is actually insulting anybody else. The 
Labels we use betray our attitude towards, towards each other. Black and white continue to be used for labeling people. We seem to be colorblind because actually I've never seen white people. I have seen pink ones. And I've not seen black people because even the, the darkest ones who are in Sudan are actually not black. They are almost purple. Why would you want to use color to define people? If we do that, uh, we pay very dearly as we are doing now in North America. Professor Jesse, I know you have a lot to share. We, okay, you have I go one, on. You I'll have one quick. minute. Yes, okay. So uh, the, the third slide is uh, on um, the roots of ethics. And I want to say that higher education does not start from the top like a tree. It starts from the way in which bring up people. So we should not concentrate too much on higher education without appreciating where else it comes from the earlier parts of education. And I hope that global ethics will take this seriously. We are like, ethics is like trees in a forest, not like a plantation. And global ethics need to be cautious not to try to have a global ethic which generalizes everything because that's not the way it is. Actually, human beings are cultural beings and originality is extremely important. Religion is important also because we cannot separate ethics from religion. And it's very important how we, 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 we relate religion to ethics. Because if we separate our ethical values from religious values, we make a very big mistake. And the final slide I have to share with you, uh, which brings us together as a continent, are the seven, uh, the, the seven objectives, seven uh, aims of the African Union. Africa now is considering itself as a people uh, with, uh, with, with the African Union as the headquarters. And this one, I don't even have to read with you because it's available online. So my bottom line is to say that we really ought to, to be, to be not to focus too much on higher education as if it is the, the, the focus. We have to edu focus on education as a whole because the value you take at the top begin from the bottom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Jesse Mugambi. We have a moment for interaction here and I see one comment. I strongly agree with Professor Jesse that ethics and teaching its principles is very important at the lower level of education where learners are in their formative years. So globeethics.net um, also recognizes this, and um, which is why we had, um, for example, a, a, a moderator and a speaker in our conference from Arigato, where they focus in ethics for children, ethics education for children. Um, Globeethics.net has defined a focus on higher education in order to um, make an impact there, but very much in conversation with the whole educational world and concepts and ideas and frameworks for all of us. There's lots of cross fertilization. Can we have any more questions or comments? We heard some fundamental proposals and some challenges from Jesse. We are one community. We are increasingly aware of that. And at the same time, the variety of cultures we come from are essential and we must put them into dialogue and keep their distinctiveness and take learnings from them. Um, the irony and the strangeness of on the one hand feeling close and being close together online right now, even in this conference, and at the same time, the realization that we may never meet um, in person, and what does that really mean? And the challenge that in this new milieu that we're, we're experimenting with, we're learning about, uh, what, what it means, what, what happens through it depends a lot on us. And that includes uh, the issue of quality. How do we make sure that there are quality proposals? There's quality education, there's quality research happening here in this online world. 
I see a comment, I mean, perhaps for, um, for, for your response, Jesse. Um, Jesse has made the, the, the claim, the, the, the exciting claim, um, that we cannot separate religion from ethics. And we have a comment that religion does give precious contribution to ethics. However, the connection of these two fields can create, um, can create problems for those who aren't religious, but who are interested in ethics. Jesse, what would you like to say to that? Yes, um, religion in my view is uh, indispensable. If we think about uh, the that aspect of uh, a people which deals with ultimate questions, ultimate origin, ultimate past, uh, purpose, and ultimate destiny. Those are not matters for, for philosophical reflection because if we continue arguing, we shall argue until the cows come home. But there is abuse of religion, misuse of religion, but there's also positive use of religion which enables us to admit our limitations as human beings. Human beings are only creatures. They're not, they're, they're not creators. And if we act as if we are creators, we are purporting to be God. So where the problem arises with the region is, is when it is, is abused or misused. But we cannot do away with that aspect of our consciousness that deals with ultimate questions. And that is religion in the broadest sense of the word. Thank you, and, and perhaps we'll, we'll bring one, one more question to you. Um, Jesse has highlighted the aims of the African Union and invited us all to reflect seriously on them. And he's brought in an African perspective. His slides and his paper have more content to them and will be part of the, the, the conference proceedings, which we're all invited to engage. Um, with us, he's brought in the, the, the idea that language has meaning and we have misused language um, in many cases and there is a need to revise it and for our goal of equity and for our goal of understanding each other's common humanity and building a global community learning one from another so we have a question here you have proposed to use the terms tropical and temperate africa and a note that tropical Africa has been used before in the history of science and humanities to the detriment of people in Africa. How can we prevent this interpretation today? And along with that, what contribution do you think the African archive has for the world when we think about sustainability in and for higher education? Yeah, two, two separate questions. Yes. Um, if anybody will tell me that Sub-Sahara Africa is more dignified than tropical Africa, I would ask him to come and live in Africa with us. Tropical Africa was used because uh, the equator, Kenya, by the way, is divided in half by the equator. And I live walking distance to the equator. And if you think about this continent compared with all the other continents, there's no reason why there should be any dispute whatsoever about the prime latitude, which is the equator. A third in the north, you have the Tropic of Cancer. In fact, the end of the Sahara Desert is where the Tropic of Cancer lies. And in the south, it is the same. Only a little part of South Africa is temperate zone with the same uh, 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 climate as the Mediterranean region. So if one uses that, it is not uh, emo emotionally charged. But the moment that one is defined by a desert, I come from Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, you know my reply? You people there, including you, Christine, you come from Sub-Tundra Sub Europe because you are just uh, um, south of the Arctic desert. How does it sound, Sub-Tundra Europe? So if we come from uh, um, uh, sub saharan Africa, you come from sub tundra Europe. Does that, 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 that sound nice? It doesn't. Now, the other one, the other one was about what? The second part? 
I have responded to the one about tropical Africa. I think this is, this is neutral because in fact, you can define the whole world with the, with the tropics because that's the way the world is and we do not make those ones. But these others are just labels which are very, very highly emotive. Thank you very much. And let me give you 30 seconds for this one, though it's key to our, our thematic track. The question is, when we think about sustainability in and for higher education, what do you think the African archive, you know, the African experience has to contribute? And I know you have a lot to say, but please just give yeah. us a, a note. Yeah. Um, when I look at all of us here, including myself, I suspect that only two of us in this conference uh, uh, who we don't have your genes, but you have ours because the origin of the human race is actually in Africa. So all of you people there have our genes, but we don't have yours. So we are the cradle of humankind. And it just happens, uh, I don't think it's by accident, by design, that the oldest surviving uh, skeleton of a human being is walking distance from where I am now in the museums of Kenya. So yes, we are the archives of the world, and we are happy to be that, and we shall protect it on your behalf. Thank you so much um, for your um, important and provocative and concrete suggestions and comments. We move on um, to another um, contextual perspective from Indonesia. Um, please, Jenny Peter. Thank you, Christine. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, also for Group Ethic Teams. Hello, everyone. I will present my salient point of uh, my contribution on my paper under the title Community Based uh, Higher Education on Sustainability as Education and Societal Quality and Experience, experience from the Maluku is Indonesia. Um, I will I will ask Victoria to share uh, my salient point. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yes, next. Maluku is a uh, one of the province uh, in eastern Indonesia, which is a uh, um, has a 1,340 island with 18 main islands or large island with a composition of 60% is uh, ocean and 30% is land. Uh, ethnic dominance in Maluku is largely it's Melanesia with mixture of uh, Malay, Arabic and some Europe racist because um, colonial history. Maluku has 62 traditional languages that are owned by each indigenous people on each island with a diversity of their respective dialect and tradition. Um, next. Okay. Um, Quality education is an education with quality value that meets uh, the following criteria. First, enhancing quality of higher education through learning with com local communities. Second, preparing for the future through indigenous people knowledge on sustainability and in period uh, adapt tradition as an context for Maluku culture because Maluku culture uh, tradition is called adapt. Uh, the third one is a uh, values driven knowledge and wisdom circulation. And higher education needs to provide solution and should not be part of the problem. Um, higher education should not only emphasize intellectual formation but also knowledge transformation. COVID-19 show how educational narrative has been unsustainable, uh, unsustainable division between theory and practice, 
between global and local between concept and application. For example, in, uh, in Indonesia, when we have a uh, COVID-19 um, to prevent uh, its uh, spreading among the, among the society, government uh, put it in a lockdown every island we, without realizing that every island is interconnected with uh, each other because our economic and everything. And also the very simple example, when um, because the lockdown of the island, we cannot uh, uh, sending our um, food from other province or um, like rice. And in the same time, uh, government asks people to provide themselves with the local food. But from 1983, they already changed local food in indigenous people. Indigenous people in Maluku Island is like other Pacific. We are eat sagu. But in 1983, sagu is changed in rice plantation to uh, offer the needed of nation. The, just is for example, um, higher education need to be favor of life of the survival of generation. Higher education need to be sustainable higher education in order to be a quality higher education. Maluku indigenous culture in next uh, slide as a basic for a community oriented higher education can be important an important instrument to correct societal division and to emphasize the value of life. The integration of culture and nature and the preservation the preservation of biodiversity. Uh, sustainable higher education is rooted in local community in the way they create knowledge and provide practice, practical example for leading sustainable life. The Maluku tradition of adapt can serve as an illustration for such a community-based higher education for sustainability. Ritual around the preservation of nature are both cognitive such a wisdom, collective memory, and practical as the rules and codes of interaction. Um, care of creation in next slide. Care of creation um, is a spiritual, became an integrate part and becomes the main value in Adat or Maluku culture. Uh, there are four core ritual elements from, uh, form from the tradition of Adat. Um, first is kewang, kewang known as the guardianship of nature, guardianship of nature. Panoar is the determination of prohibition period to exploit nature. Sasi, system of prohibition to deprive nature and chuchinagri as a cleansing, cleansing ritual village. The other provide in an integrate system of uh, nature preservation that is close related to the Maluku people consciousness on who they are, their identity, how they reactualize their identity in time culture, collective memory based on the strict value system and how they project themselves in the future to continue, continue of a community in harmony with nature. Um, the integrated way of uh, perceiving active preservation of nature as a basic for sustainability can serve as a model for quality in higher education, emphasize, emphasizing value formation. You will see in the next slide, uh, the diagram of four elements in Adat or Maluku culture, Kewang, Sasi, Tanoar, Chuchinegri, with their um, function and also their hierarchy, Kewang is a hierarchical system, Sasi is a norm, Tanuar is a knowledge, Chuchinagi is ritual, and they serve um, different goal, but in the holistic, in the whole, whole uh, uh, understanding and the whole system. You have one minute. Okay, the, okay. and the last for the silent point, um, that understanding indigenous in the next, um, people intellectual insight for a sustainable future education because humanity and nature are inseparable. The study of human and the study of nature belong together. 
uh, this, the Maluku symbolic system is related to understanding of the function of human body. All is interrelated and the ritual serve the interest of reactualizing this understanding of unity and belonging. The study of different uh, discipline related to studying and gaining insight from different perspectives and in relation to the context. Education in favor of sustainability must convey this value and understanding of this value is obtained by community-based learning. That's my salient point for my paper in almost seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, invaluable reflections from a contextual perspective. Um, we now move to invite Professor Jeremy uh, Punt, who's a professor at the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa, um, to come in as our listener. He has the important role of capturing some the essence of this session and, and bringing it to our conference on the 25th of June. We also wanted to give him a moment to, to feed back to us three points that have come to him as a result of the conversation thus far. Please, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Christine. And from my side, also hi to, to everybody around the world. Uh, I'll try to keep it very short. I'm not going to try to summarize. So the first point I started thinking about even before the session, and that's in the title of our session, where we use quality and ethical uh, standards together. So quality and ethics may seem to be rather obvious to use together, but I think we also need to acknowledge, and I think uh, uh, Jesse and uh, Jenny have in various different ways also shown how quality and ethics uh, are not natural bedfellows and, and we, that we need to be alert to the fact that, that keeping them together uh, are going to give us some challenges. Flowing from that, a second observation, and that is that, that a higher, a higher education, quality, ethics, all of that, all of that is impacted by larger social trends and perceptions. And it's interesting, um, we've all listened to, to Jesse's uh, great presentation, all interested by larger social trends and perceptions, if you like a larger discourse. Um, and that, that is made up of labeling, labeling having to do with geograph geog um, geography, having to do with, with racial and and uh, ethnographical concepts and so on. Um, and all of it pointing to our very uneven, unequal context. And I think that raises a serious question for us. And, and, and that is, how do we, well, if one, one is pessimistic, can we even influence, impact this discourse that forms what we see as globality, as the global world in which we live in? Uh, because it seems as if we simply talk about higher education, quality and ethics, and we don't look into ways to impact that larger discourse that, that, that influences our understanding of higher education, what goes with it, then, then we, we may not be so successful in impacting higher education. And then a third uh, uh, observation, um, that it's very clear, and I think uh, not only Jesse, but also Jenny has alluded to that, that is that higher education is not, is not a goal in itself. Of course, it is at times also a, a goal and students study and they want their degrees and we want to do the research, but it, it's about much more. And it's that values-driven aspect, it's that values-driven dimension um, that will be unpacked in various different ways in different parts of the world. Sustainability is, is an important aspect. And if we just think about the times in which we live here in South Africa, we focus very much on, on saving lives. Um, and now also gradually also on saving life, livelihoods. So we're talking about health and we're talking about economics, but we're talking about much more when it comes to sustainability. And it seems to, seems to me that, that that is also a larger concept that we would have to try to ask about. And then Christine, just to close off, just the last comment, I, I didn't think of, of raising that, but I think uh, 
uh, especially uh, Jenny's contribution, but also some of what, what Jesse has said, uh, means that uh, makes it important to lift that out. And that is the, the important aspect of nature, ecology, people will give you different names, but the ecological dimension. It's got to do with sustainability, but it's also larger. It's, it's about more than that. The connection between that and higher education, apart from people training in, in ecological, um, uh, de well, in degrees in e ecology and nature preservation and so on, of course, there it's obvious. But at higher education, um, that, that, that higher education also has to do with with how we think and understand the world in which we live. And, and we've Thank all seen you. wonderful videos and so on of late of, of animals walking around where, where, where we've driven them away, but now returning because of lockdown situation and so on. And, and that's a, maybe a I'm good- I'm going to have to close you off. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. All four points, very helpful. And you're right, in that last one, not everyone is, is making that connection, but increasingly we are. All right, we move now to Hani. Hani Hassan, you have seven minutes. You need to take yourself off of mute. As he's coming in, I remind everybody, please be active in the chat. Please share your thoughts and your questions for our speakers. Let's have a running dialogue. Let's have a conversation. Okay. All right, Hani. Okay, so I, I I will start my 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 presentation directly to because we are limited time about my story our story in Egypt in Egypt now in higher education we apply the quality assurance standards and try to combine with the ethical standards also so in in our in our system we have twelve standards uh, quality assurance standards. Uh, which all the uh, higher institution, higher education institutions must be applied to be accredited in, in our system. These 12 standards uh, have also 79 uh, evaluating indicator. All these institutions have to cover all these uh, standards to be accredited. The first one uh, shortly is a strategic planning for the institute and for the program. The second standard is the leadership and governance. The third one is the management of the quality assurance program. The fourth one is the uh, uh, faculty and the associated staff. The, four, uh, the fifth one is the administrative staff. The sixth is the uh, resources, financial resources. Uh, seven is the academic uh, standards and education programs. Uh, the uh, eighth is the teaching and learning. Uh, nine is the student and alumni and then go to the scientific research and the scientific activities and the postgraduate students and the final uh, one is the community uh, participation and the env environmental development all these 12, 12 standards which are applied in our system must be covered uh, to be accredited as an institute beside that we try to plus uh, the ESIC, uh, uh, ESIC which uh, the the uh, our uh, uh, agency, uh, uh, accredited agency uh, approved it. Uh, they, uh, as, as we see here, we try to uh, make the party uh, flexibility, equality, which uh, uh, Dr. Mugabe called that there are no discrimination in, in our system, there are equality, there are respect, there are integrity, there are honesty, uh, ac ac uh, accountability. Uh, uh, cooperation, participation, participation, uh, integrity, uh, transparency, fairness, responsibility, objectivity, uh, neutrality, endless because the quality is the is the endless process and the trust. All these either quality and ethic standards may reach to increase the scales of our uh, graduates 
and to try to change it to the uh, competency uh, education standards, which will level, increase or enhance the level of the learning and which be lead to the competences uh, curriculum. Try to summarize what we say, that the higher education like this bird has two wings, as I said in, in my summary, the ASIC wing and the quality, quality assurance, and this higher education try to fly in this environment to change the quality assurance into quality enhancement, to change the ILOs and scales into competences, try to change the education for living, which I take it from the track one into education for uh, life, and change the graduate into an ethical citizens which we try to make ethics and the quality are a life of style, lifestyle. So try to implement in our students that the ethics plus quality is lifestyle. So when we summarize also is that the quality assurance, when we apply quality assurance only, may be uh, illustrate uh, graduates with the skills. But when we uh, apply ethics only, may be for us the envi environment of the ethical behavior it's okay but when we apply post quality and ethics that may be quality assurance and ethics may be uh, gives moral distinguished and uh, professionally citizen and this is the new vision of our of our university the last last days we focus on the graduates now nowadays all the university and the vision of the university focus to outcome a moral citizen citizen as a as a human being also we when we apply the quality assurance with the essex we try to change the style of education from the teaching and the skills based education into competence based education now the challenge is how to transfer or to apply the quality and essex standard from the hard copy classes, traditional classes, into which, uh, virtual classes, which will be, I think that it will be, vir these, these virtual classes and virtual universities, it will be, uh, in the future, it will be applied there. At last, please accept this flower, and thanks for your hearing and for your attention. And this is a now, a now time of discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and so our listener, Jeremy, you know, noted that it's a challenge. And our, our speaker, Hani, began to affirm the, the necessity of, the, of, of the, the, the possibility of quality and ethics um, being hand in hand and some specific um, roadmap, you know, to, to how to get there, and especially as we move from in-person to online and blended environments. So yes. thank you for casting this vision and beginning to um, give us some uh, roadmap on how to get there. We're going to move right on into our next, um, our next speaker, and after that we will have some time for question and answer and engagement. Um, please do continue the conversation on the chat, and I welcome with pleasure our, our panelist, Benoit Giradin. Thank you very much, Susie. <clears throat> and um, hello to everybody. Basically, I want to draw some lessons from uh, what we have in different countries, what we have experienced through the COVID uh, situation. Indeed, I believe that COVID-19 pandemic has revealed the shortcomings of several handlings, such as the demagogical handling, focusing on denial and banalization, then the technocratic approach, focusing only on test material, quantity of respirators, masks, PPEs, the gnostical or overemphasizing only knowledge or academic knowledge, research, medical sciences, as if, as if, as if it would suffice, and the authoritarian approach also 
characterized by bureaucratic top-down denial, lengthy realization of the pandemic. <clears throat> now, holistic approaches to deal with uh, properly, efficiently with the COVID are, have to blend medical sciences, economics, social sciences, along with some social knowledge about acceptance by populations, these have proved much more effective. Do you hear me? Okay. That requires high education institutions to go for solid interdisciplinary approaches. This is my point. Beyond classical container kind of or departmental uh, disaggregation a culture of interactive, rapid electronic negotiations based on established reliable and collaborative networks proves essential. The example of Germany where a researcher from a public university immediately linked his discoveries with, private, with friends of private companies have saved two weeks to the German approach and this has a lot of positive consequences. So this interactive interactivity beyond public-private separations. So those interactions should not remain limited within interdepartmental interactions as we use in universities, so between so-called departments or faculties, but they should run across domains and also move on the, on the edge between institutions, academic institutions on one side, companies, private companies in their respective industry, as well as community like Jesse was pointing out, and more generally between public and private. In this approach, holistic approach, ethics could play an inspiring and even a leading role in keeping consistent the whole approach, in organizing multidisciplinary platforms and advocating for a clear focus on activating responsibility, sustainability, equity, solidarity, peace and security, unity and diversity. This is what I call my ethical hexagon. Now, managing dilemmas has been seen as the critical and difficult challenge. Managing dilemma as a skill needs to be further taught and trained in high education institutions. For instance, to reach balanced trade-off between cost and health between isolation and social bound, between hygiene requirements and overcrowded neighborhoods, between addressing public health versus social discrimination of groups or ages. And in that respect, higher education institutions need to develop skills, both education and training, in dilemmas management, as well as skills in electronic negotiations based on those key ethical requirements. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for speaking uh, within your time and speaking from your vast experience with a very concrete proposal. And we are all hungry to learn more about it. I've assured the participants it will be available in the conference proceedings, and this is only one step in a larger dialogue. We want to go more into depth in, in this. Right now, it's my pleasure to introduce um, David Montalegre, who's a PhD candidate at Toronto School of Theology. And I would like to invite him to bring some questions um, that have emerged in the chat for our speakers. 
Hello, everybody. And my apologies. I have a very, very big problem with fire alarms in this uh, building. So that's why I was late. Um, yes, uh, I have been reviewing the chat and reviewing the questions. And there is some important questions that people have highlighted. And one of the main questions that I found here for every, everybody, every speaker is, how do you measure quality in higher education? And this uh, question is linked with uh, another question that is related, what have been your experience measuring quality in higher education? So this is one of the questions. I don't know if we can answer that or we continue with another question. Is there someone that would like to address that question? So I think the impact, the impact on solving societal problems or challenges, um, economical dilemmas and so on, this capacity to have an impact, to be efficient, is, um, let us say, an indicator, a marker of quality. Do you agree? Agree. Agree. Yes, and maybe uh, uh, I add something that, as our colleagues say, that it, according to the economical uh, standards or economical levels or something, because the quality, it needs the money. Quality needs uh, financial support uh, to be uh, overcome the standards which we, we, we said it before. But it is variable from one institute to another. When we uh, beginning in the in the starting with the quality assurance in the higher education, it just it just uh, uh, first step. When we take uh, your accreditation from the national national accredited body, I think it is it is the, you pass the first step. Then try to go to not quality assurance. Try to travel more 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 over to quality enhancement, how to enhance or how to increase you, this, the baseline, the quality assurance is the baseline for, for the education. I think that is, it is, it is, it is, it can be measurable by this standard, which we're overcome, or you, you, you believed or achieved this, this standard, according to the reviewer and according to side visit, I think, I think it will be, it be measurable. The quality must be measurable. Yeah. Um, this question leads us to the next question that I found very, very important. And as the question on how to measure high quality standards when people have access, enough access to internet, uh, how to measure like high quality standards of higher education um, when, through in poor people or through in poor places where the uh, the opportunities and the possibilities are not like we are talking. Infrastructure, internet or something like this is one of the infrastructure which is needed for, 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 uh, for each or every, every uh, uh, higher education institute. And I think, and this is the challenge which uh, I, I told in my in my presentation: how to how to transfer this the, the solid standards into the measurable standards for the virtual classes and the distance and distance learning and e-learning. And this is a challenge. So uh, we we try to together to put some standards uh, for uh, evaluating the quality the quality of the distance and e-learning and something like this. And for Jenny, um, there is a very clear question that is maybe the question also in some countries in, South, in, 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 in the Global South, and is how can we integrate indigenous knowledge in our knowledge of ethics in higher education, or let's say authentic knowledge from communities in the ethics of, in higher education, or is it an important important ethics that we apply in our institutions 
could I respond? I, okay. No, first, Jenny. No, no, but first, Jenny, because the question is referred directly to her. On my paper, I actually already, uh, put it about um, we can learn from how to measure the quality higher education to make sure every aspect is included. Like in my paper, I uh, propose how uh, community base in higher education is very important because like we're talking about ecotheology in the frame of uh, indigenous people, but until now, the uh, uh, approach of indigenous people knowledge in ecotheology is just like in the romantic ways. I'm living three years with indigenous people in the jungle, in the forest, in uh, Seram Island, in one of the mainly very big uh, with indigenous people in the uh, Maluku province. Uh, I I put it, I, I highlight the, the needed of a community-based learning. So the, the uh, student can learn from the first hand about um, sustainability uh, living and also a student can understanding and life values of indigenous people um, not in the romantic uh, ways but really have affection to the knowledge and when you put it in a community based learning is very important um, um, when you provide this uh, platform on online education in higher education with community base, it's also provide their voice when they're struggling uh, with their um, life with, to protect their island, their forest, and everything from the mining for the from the big uh, corporation and everything. And for me, it is very important. That's my uh, response. Okay, the next panel is the next speaker that want to answer. No, my, my experience is that um, basically um, societal knowledge is quite much richer than uh, we anticipated. So they are making links, as it was said, between spirituality and ecology and social life and sobriety. So these links are today for us a challenge, and for them it is a reality. So we should learn also from, from them and try to transform their own knowledge into a, a language that is, let us say, accessible to uh, perhaps to more academic um, formulation and international formulation. But we have to learn and there is a big, uh, a rich, uh, let us say, source of knowledge and practice. Yeah, this is this is very 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 important, uh, Professor Benoit. Can you please show us again your hexagon that the people is asking? I, but I know like, we are. I, I know we are going to share it. Yes, is, is I, shall, right? I shall post it. I shall post it. Yeah, and, uh, but yeah. the people is asking if you can not explain it in detail, but just a little. Yeah. Oh. One minute. It's it's an hexagon, you know. It's I developed it in my book Ethics in Politics uh, in 2012 by Globe Ethics, and this is a way to let us say to to um, delineate justice or fairness into more precise, let us say, uh, axes. Uh, justice, which is not sustainable, is. Um, is empty and uh, but we have also in, in in societies when we discuss about justice we should immediately say what about solidarity with remote areas with discriminated groups we should immediately say uh, how do we manage the conflict the peace and the security but managing the conflict uh, properly then the equity, the equitable access, then the whole responsibility, which is for me a way to, let's say, instead of liberty, I prefer responsibility because there is an element of choice, 
but an element of accountability. And then unity, diversity, diversity, it is how a society try to, to manage a kind of a common bound, a common heart in a sense, or common spirit, but allowing diverse ways of living, diverse ways of uh, understanding the challenges and so on to, to interact. So um, <clears throat> these six uh, markers of six, I would say, axes are a more concrete way to, to let's say, to, to check whether justice is improving or, or not. You may say quality of life uh, for Hani Hassani, but uh, so this is my my um, okay my submission. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Mugambi. Do you have something to add? Because yes. the next yes. question. Yes, okay. Yes, yes I please. Do. Um, <clears throat> it happens that I, I serve in the Commission for University Education in in Kenya. And it happens also that my university has been ranked uh, quite high in the uh, global assessments uh, together with the universities of Southern Africa. I wanted to say that um, one of the challenges that we face um, in most of Africa is that higher education is uh, alienating because the language of instruction is not the language used at home. As soon as I close this computer, I shall stop speaking English. And uh, I, sh I shall not speak it again until I, I go to the university. This is not the case with the majority of the people that we are communicating with on this, on this platform. Because the language of nurture is also the language at the university, is the language of religion. Because of our history, it is like Europe uh, under the Roman Empire uh, many centuries ago. And we have to deal with this alienation where schooling is different from education. Professor Mugambi, I think we lost him. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. And I hope you can be back soon with us. Um, Yes, uh, indeed. Thank you very much for your questions. And this has been a very, very interesting session. And um, I just passed to Christine. And I, uh, and I thank again to all uh, our participants in the chance that I have shared your concerns and questions with our panelists and speakers. It's on you, Christine. Thank you very much, David. And we're at our time, but with your permission, I'd like to give each of our speakers a closing word, um, if you could make it brief. Um, let's begin with Jesse and move in order. Jesse. Uh, Jesse's gone. Let's go to Jenny. Okay, um, my last slide statement that we agree that education should provide solution, not be a part of a problem. And uh, for me, success of higher education is not just only to produce a scholar who have a knowledge and intellectual, but also have a ability to transform the knowledge for a sustainable uh, life and community-based higher education on sustainability um, uh, as an education and sociality, social, social social quality um, is, is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Please, honey, put yourself off mute. My 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 last word here in 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 in, in this session that changing changing from knowledge only to competences and the skills, I think it will be uh, more professional for the community and for the uh, graduates. Applied of, I, I repeat, applied of Essex uh, with the quality standards, it will be uh, produce uh, ethical citizen. And this is an important issue here. 
at, at, at last here in Egypt. Uh, last, last one, uh, that, uh, as our colleague says from Canada, that quality need, need, need the money, need the financial, uh, financial support. So uh, it is very important to, but just to start in, in this road, I think it, it, it will be completed uh, safely. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Benoit. Uh, I would um, advocate for a big challenge between, let us say, past, present, present challenges and future sustainability, but also uh, negotiating between South and North or be between different cultures instead of, uh, let us say, antagonizing cultures, trying to find um, let us see, interactions, negotiations, and that requires a lot of learning and listening capacity. Thank you very much. And thank you so much to our, our speakers, our co-moderator and our listener. Um, I love the image of the eagle that Hani brought in. <laughs> it helps to have images, you know, with ethics as one wing and quality assurance as the other. Um, we've We've, we've heard challenges to take seriously the language we use, to take seriously contextual perspectives, to work from within our communities and cultures and draw out their wisdom for the benefit of that community and the whole world, for, for solid interdisciplinary approaches, including a sense of connectedness with nature, the need to develop measurements for quality, a consensus that, that there is or needs to be an intrinsic relationship between quality and ethics. And that was the proposal of this session coming from a globeethics.net perspective. An acknowledgement that for many, they are not easy bedfellows and that it is a challenge. And some concrete proposals for creating those quality standards and good measurements that include ethics. Um, including uh, a deep listening, as we just heard from Benoit. So this is the work of GlobeEthics.net and um, to gather the international community in doing just such work is at the heart of our purpose in, in holding this conference. And as we've noted um, in our materials, we see this moment as part of an ongoing process to go deeper together in research, in working groups, in further conferencing, um, and in whatever else we can imagine. Um, in, in the short term, for the rest of this conference period, we draw your attention to the fact that there's uh, another live chat on thematic track four, which is around ethics and responsible global citizenship tomorrow at the same time, 3 p.m. CET. Central European time. On Wednesday, there is a live chat led by our library and publications um, departments to give you a greater exposure to what we offer and how you might use it and connect with it and how we might use it together. Um, our conference itself is on Thursday, 25 June from three to six. So it will be a three hour webinar featuring these four thematic tracks with some of the same speakers you've seen and some different ones. Uh, we also remind you that there is the online discussion forum that is ongoing and you have the chance to read the, the digital papers and virtual posters which have been submitted by, um, by participants. And there's also a chance to vote. There will be, there will be an award presented to the one with the most votes. So, most important, I'd like to thank you um, for being here with us as participants and to tell you that we look forward to staying in touch, um, look forward to seeing you again online in the discussion forum, in the next chat, in the conference and beyond. So um, we, we officially close the session here. Thank you for your um, permission to extend it just a little bit to hear from our wonderful speakers. And before we end the session um, informally, we invite you to turn your, your mics off of mute and say hello if you would wish.
uh, just for an informal moment together. So again, thank you. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see everybody. Hi. Thank you very much. Nice meeting all of you. Nice meeting you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Thank, thank you for all. Thank, thank you for you. the organizer. Ah. Thank you for all. Trust and Ross for tomorrow. Speeches and um, good information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Good night, much. Good night from uh, Bye. Bye. Island. Thank you for the good night from Maldives. Good night from Makassar.